Hi, y'all. This is Kristen Chenoweth. Hi, I'm Gloria Stefan. This is Sarah Bareilles. Hi, I'm Patty Lapone. This is Lynn Manuel Miranda. You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Well, hello. Welcome to the Theater Podcast. Intimate personal conversations with the industry's biggest names. Today's guest is Stephanie Stiles, who you may know from Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, Kiss Be Kate, Goosebumps the Musical, the original concept album. I love this trend now of so many people who are creating entire musicals and putting them into a concept album, a studio album, that then, of course, gets work done, gets workshopped, and with the event eventual goal, I would suspect, of bringing it to the stage and actually putting it up. But it doesn't come easy. There is a lot of production that actually goes into these cast albums because they're treating them as if they're completely fully fleshed shows. And this one is no different based on the R.L. Stein books that have sold the most copies ever of any book series, says the Guinness Book of World Records. But <laughs> Stephanie Stiles, man, she is truly a magnificent person. She kept talking about how great her friends are versus talking about herself, which in you know this world of acting, <laughs> everybody loves to talk about themselves. She loved to support her friends. She is truly just this incredible person. Of course, a huge Disney fan. That's no secret. And we dove deep into Disney I'm sorry if you're here for some theater stuff, but Stephanie and I talked about so much more. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Find me on Instagram and Twitter at theater underscore podcast on Facebook slash official theater podcast. Leave a rating and a review wherever you're listening. Everybody now, please enjoy this episode with Stephanie Stiles. Today's guest made her Broadway debut in the recent Roundabout Theater revival of Kiss Me Kate opposite Kelly O'Hara and Corbin Blue. On TV, she may be best known, maybe? She may be. On TV, she may be best known as the lonely barista Autumn on Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist and can also be seen as Kate in the Netflix series Bonding or on the big screen in the film Bombshell. She can now be heard on the amazing studio cast album of Goosebumps, the musical now available on Ghostlight Records. Stephanie Stiles, welcome to the Theater Podcast. I'm so happy to be here. And what's so funny is I go into a voice sometimes that is almost that exact me. Beep, beep, beep. Oh, really? <laughs> beep, 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 beep. It's like sometimes this weird voice that I talk in. So it felt very personalized to me, and I appreciate that. Well, um, so should we just talk like we're from Fargo? Is that kind of where, oh, you, where you're coming from? Or, or? It truly originated as a pet voice that I exclusively used when talking to formerly Baby Yoda, currently Grogu, <laughs> in that... Um, I would just, uh, what's so funny is also we, I, in our pre little podcast moment, we were just talking about how we had met at Broadway con. Mm -hmm. And what's so funny is that was a time that was a, that was like my, like, mo I, 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 I'm looking at two different baby Yodas as we speak over on my couch, but that was a time when truly my like boyfriend would turn to me and be like, what are you looking at? And I'd be like, nothing. And it would just be like a picture of baby Yoda on my phone that I just, like, I just would be looking at pictures of baby Yoda. And um, so, it, yeah. So basically, and I just remembered that specific time where he was like, what do you, what do you keep looking at? And I just was like trying to hide that. I was looking at these baby Yoda pictures over and over again. Do you have a baby Yoda voice? I don't do, I like not well, but well, the voice that I used to, I just, well, I started calling, I just like BB, like I would just like, I would just like go into, I mean, like Baby Yoda has like a meme voice where it's always saying like, he like is the way people type as Baby Yoda is like very specific. And so like, I would try to speak that. So it's just like, but it ends up me being like, BB, and saying BB over and over and over and over again. That almost and, kind of sounds like Beaker from Muppets. Okay, this is this podcast is already blowing my mind. <laughs> I, Beaker is the Muppet that I like identify most closely with, and I told <laughs> Cor Corbin and I were like tagged in something once during Kiss Me Kate, where they were like comparing us to something that was like fictional. But then I was like, Corbin, I had this thought that I was like, you and me as a duo the two entities that I think we're most similar to 
are uh, Professor Honeydew and Beaker. I was like, I feel like our Bill Calhoun and Lois Lane are basically that. And then someone photoshopped it and it was great. And so I, so I very much, I love Beaker and I love that you said that. So that makes me so happy. Well, you're very welcome. I, I didn't plan on getting this into this until like near the end, but let's just dive into the Disney aspect because oh I know my. on even on your profile, your Instagram profile, you're, it says you're a charter member of D23, which of course the official Disney fan club. And thank you. The, thank you. Yes. Yeah, and this is an audio-only podcast. You are smiling from ear to ear. You are nodding. You are happy. This is... Uh, uh, t- okay, so tell me about your love of Disney. And as an adult, a full-fledged adult... Oh, fully uh, Disney adult. Fully Disney adult. Oh, Alan, what are you... I mean, to start this, are you a Disney adult? Or are you okay. like just adjacent to the community? No, no, no. So I think you're going to be happy to hear that my grandfather was uh, part of the engineering team. That helped Stop. build Disney oh. World. Unbelievable. He That's was, incredible. He was called an Imagineer. That was the title that he got. Yes. And he was basically a project manager that made sure that all of the rides got built. And uh, and he he would source, he'd do costs and scheduling and use project management. And so he knew all the secrets of the rides because he helped build them. And took them to his grave. I don't know. He wouldn't tell me. He still kept the magic. He kept the magic alive. And I have so, much respect so him. I would to answer your question. Yes, I, I am. It's a in Disney your adult. blood. It's we went to Disney Disney World. Literally, I probably had gone twenty or uh, thirty or thirty five times or so by the time I was twenty. It was Incredible. just because we got we got in free whenever we went with him. It was just like oh yeah. you know here multi pass like we just got in. Incredible. Incredible. I mean, and what's interesting is I, yes, as you said, I'm a charter member of D23. It, you know, it's the thing about me that I just feel like, I'm like, what's my bio? Let's just sum this up. This is the situation. I am, um, and not to get horoscopy about it. And there's people who will know this so much more than me, but I am, I am very much, I love horoscopes because I personally identify with mine so much in that I am a Libra sun, Libra moon, lots of Libra, but then I'm an Aquarius rising. And a thing about Aquarius rising, so it's like how you present. I think one of the elements is like you kind of lead with the thing that makes you like the thing you love or like the thing that makes you unique or different. Although like I do love something that is one of the most... The two things I love like materialistic wise in the world are two very basic things and that they're Disney and Taylor Swift. So for me to like be like, yeah, that's the thing I love that I enter with. It's very basic. But I very much like within now that we're like back in the world and I'm starting to like meet new people again, I'm like, I realized that, yeah, within the first five sentences of me talking, I somehow find a way to mention Disney or like try to like, or something Disney automatically comes up. <laughs> Even with you and me, you're like, why don't we just get into this? Like, this is just her. This is what, how we get a meeting. No, but I do love Disney. And what's interesting about what you said is Disney parks, I think are, maybe my most favorite thing about Disney. So I have so much respect for the Imagineers and anyone who works on those projects and puts everything together. So yeah, I love it so, so much. Tell me you've watched all of the episodes of Behind the Magic on Disney+. Oh, Plus. oh of course. Of yes. course. Yes. I love, I love it all. Well, what's interesting... Okay, so actually, and I will be totally honest about this. I watched all the episodes of... Um, the Imagineering story. Mm-hmm. When it comes to behind the attraction, I, mean, I, attraction am, that's what it is. I am trying to. I because I was burning through TV too much. I am trying to spread them out. So I have. Not, I don't think I've watched like the last two because I truly because there's so much great stuff. But the uh, I've got to say the watch call element. The the Imagineering. I want them to do more park stuff. It was so much parks in the beginning. And now I'm just like, I need more. Like, like it, it, I love all their original series, but at first it was like, imagine mirroring story documentaries about like Howard Ashman. Like I, I want more like behind the scenes stuff. So that's my, I, I love, I love that, that they get into the, the politics of how or why a ride did or did not happen at a particular time. Mm-hmm. Of, I don't know. Uh, I don't remember the order of the episodes, but you know, it's a small world was created for the New York world's fair. Mm-hmm. And uh, as were some others in it. And it was at some point there was like 
talk of not doing it, and then they brought it back. And you know, Walt Disney died before Disney World, uh, I think, even started construction. Look and- at you, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's all of this, this the politics, the corporate politics of this, which somehow is really intriguing to me. I love oh, the business yeah. of all of this, and that makes it even more magical that through all of this financial, the financial stuff and the vision and and the trouble that they had making rides, and you know, even like literally buying acres and acres of swamp land in mm-hmm. Florida, that you can turn this into what it is now, and it's phenomenal, and it touches. Why? Okay, so why do you think? What do you think? It. Oh, 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 oh! I'm gonna back up because you said you're Libra. Happy belated birthday. Thank you. What are you? A Libra. Ah, How wonderful. So I don't know Jack about horoscopes. And you said Libra rising, sun, moon setting, whatever it is. What does that mean? Uh, So you, if you are saying you're a Libra, I assume that means that your son is in Libra. Your son is like the thing that it's like, we go to the back of the magazine. You look for what your horoscope is. It's talking about your son. I am not an expert about this. You could, I know you host a co-hosted introduced Catherine Gallagher and I talk about someone who would know way more about this than me, Catherine Gallagher. Mm. Um, anyone just like, there's a ton of people who know a lot more about this. So my, um, depending on where you were born and what time is where you get everything else, all your other placements, we're talking even like people's like where your Venus is, where your Mars is, but the main top three, like if you have any horoscope app on your phone, and you know, and that's why like it's very popular now for moms to receive texts from their kids where they're like, "What time was I born?" And um, <laughs> and um, so it's very common. And um, one of my friends posted some joke about how um, it was like the son being like, "What time was I born, mom?" And the mom's like, "Stay away from that woman." Like basically being like, clearly a girl was wondering like what this guy's horoscope was. And that's why the only reason a guy would text his mom what for his what time he was born. Anyways, I'll so say that my son and my moon are labor than my rising is Aquarius. So I don't know what your moon and your rising would be if I unless you put it into a thing and you could tell me. But I mean, I think it's oh. supposed to be that sun is your I'm gonna get this wrong. I'm gonna get this wrong. Sun is your personality, moon is your emotions, and rising is what you like present as, like first impression. I don't know. That might be off. Oh. So, but because my sun and my moon are the same, I feel like off it. I'm just very much a Libra. So you're a Libra. And as Edie from Grey Garden says, she always says, I got to find a Libra man. She We're was all her about dream. the balance. We're about the yeah. balance. Yeah, that is true. It. Well, Incredible. now I need to now I need to balance the conversation, bring it back to goosebumps, which wow, is which is why we're here today. That is a segue, probably one of today? the worst ones I've ever used, but that That's is a true. segue. Oh, okay, cool. Um, Goosebumps, <laughs> Goosebumps is the musical Phantom of the Auditorium. It's an original studio cast recording. Of course, you were part of it among a, a slew of amazing people. Christina Alabato, Noah Galvin, Alex Brightman, Will Rowan, of course, uh, Cheryl Lee Ral- Ralph. This is incredible. And the Goosebumps based on the book by R.L., the series of books by R.L. Stein, which, what, what is the stat that I'm looking for? Named the world's best-selling book series. An, uh, yeah, it was named the best-selling book series of all time in 2003 by Guinness Book of World Records, right? Wow. Like, did you know that? I'm, I'm finding out right now. That's incredible. It, I believe you were, it. You were I believe today it. years old. I was today years old. I you were today it. years old when you learned that. And it sold more than 400 million copies. This album. Tell me about the album because based, uh, I guess let's start with the the studio cast album concept in general. Because for me, uh, when I was when I was a wee lad, I didn't see. I mean, they didn't make studio cast albums. It was on Broadway, and then you made a uh, cast recording. Yeah, right. Same. And I've and then now is it has this? I mean, you're closer to the industry, like. Uh, I, I guess seeing everything that's going by with you and your peers and whatnot is this has seemed to have become a thing that can we trace it back to to six? Is that Maybe. why people are making cast album or studio albums now? That makes sense. It's definitely uh, I. This was my first foray into it, but I definitely had friends. I mean, I think I remember like growing up a musical theater fan, and I would listen to like songwriter album, like 
composer where they were just like, here are all my songs and here are different Broadway people singing all my songs. And those songs didn't necessarily even have shows, but you got to hear songs that way. And then I feel like probably that's how people got readings or workshops of those musicals that those songs were in. And then we're like, oh, well, why don't we do the whole show? And I, 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 I really don't know what like, the gestation process was for these studio recordings happening, but it really, I, when I was presented with it, I was like, this is amazing. I love everything that's happening here. Yes. And also to like, it is a very weird thing because you hear people who do animated features all the time talking about this, but to be a part of something with so many cool people, but then you're also very much like, I have never sang technically with Cheryl Lee Ralph. And yet, I have a song on iTunes with Cheryl Lee Ralph. Like it's the coolest thing. Like I'm pitching myself. She's an icon. And so like, it's so cool. But then you're also like, wow, like this is truly like machines and making this happen. And it, it just was really awesome. And I was so happy when they asked me and just like, it's also my truly my like childhood dream show and the concept of it. And then I listened to the songs and I'm like, these are unbelievable songs like they're so good so it's very interesting and and i think it's also i remember the day because we got we heard previews of it but the day it came out i was like i'm gonna listen to like i'm gonna start at the beginning and it's such a great example of just like a show you can sit or do whatever you're doing and just like listen to all the way through i think it's done so well with all the songs the parts of dialogue because we're doing dialogue too Mm -hmm. And it's just so great. And I remember like sitting, actually, I remember like sitting in my bedroom as a child and just listening to the fan of the opera in its entirety and like crying at the end and like reading a booklet with the lyrics and just like after school, cause that was so cool. Like just doing that. And so that's what it felt like revisiting this, not only because obviously it has a lot of like phantom themes, but it's just so, I think it's done so well. And everyone is so good on it. People, they, everyone is so good on it. And I'm just like lucky to be here. It's amazing, and I had a great time. I love that. I was going to ask when, uh, when I guess the recording, and when and how the recording happened, because uh, I know there are so many, especially people who are in shows right now. There, there's so many COVID regulations and so many restrictions to how you can just exist in an inside space without. I, I, yeah, with the number of people and how close you can get and when you need to get tested and all that. And you said, like, uh-huh. you've got a, a song with Cheryl. And so you weren't recording, were you recording uh-huh. live in a studio with anybody else or did they bring in everybody individually and combine it all in post? I, you know, that's a really great question for the creatives. On my side, what I can tell you is that I was in, by myself in a studio and then in a separate room was the engineer and the composer. And that was... You recorded from home. No, 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 no. I recorded in a studio, but in a separate... Like, I was in the studio, and then they were in a total... Like, in the other room next to the studio. So it just was... I truly was the most isolated I could be. It felt so... I was like, well, this feels like the safest thing in these circumstances, because I am so alone. (laughs) Um, and, and they had, you know, I think they had, um, I don't know, remember when in the process was because they had orchestrations, but then I know they even did even more because there's a huge orchestra in it and they sound so incredible, but it truly was like, I did it all in two days and I, um, including like, obviously understudy buddy is like the main thing that I do along with, uh, the duet with Cheryl and then uh but like I have some like I sing the opening number I sing the closing number I sing randomly I'm like the Christine Daae track on the story of the phantom like the really high notes Mm -hmm. which was a dream of mine that I've been practicing since I truly was like six years old trying to hit those notes and now I have a recording of it so that's good for my little soul and then um i truly think i sing my highest notes that i have and my lowest notes that i have on goosebumps the studio cast album so i'm glad that those exist in case i ever need to like show my grandchildren and be like this is how granny used to sound but um but it's it's yeah it was really it was definitely odd but amazing and i just i mean it had been so long since i'd sang and 
so long since I like ever thought I would get to sing again, you know, other than like walking around my apartment. And it was truly, I felt amazing. And the material is so good. And it's a role that I had so much fun doing because I just love these character parts. And I find myself in a lot of like lyric patter heavy places. And Understudy Buddy is not, not that. It has a lot of words and it's fun. And Aww. it just was, it was really great. So I enjoyed it. And I love Halloween. So it was amazing. Well, I don't know if you, if, it was hyperbole, but you said you were doing uh, Phantom at six years old. My next, my next question was going to be uh, when you first started performing. And obviously, if you're, if it was six, literally, then I believe that's got to be some sort of parents' influence or or envir- <laughs> environment influence to sort of bring that music into your world. So, how did you first start, like realizing you love singing and uh, and and the musical theater aspect of that? Where did that come in? Well, what's interesting is. I, my parents, I think, always really appreciated theater. Neither of them were involved uh, in early on in my life. And, but their first date was to see Phantom of the Opera. Really? And so, I, Alan, I would not be here today if it weren't for the Phantom of the Opera. Wow. Um, so their first date was to see Phantom of the Opera, Michael Crawford, Sarah Brightman. And I think it's just because it was like the cool thing to do. Everyone was like, this this musical, like everyone's loving in New York City. You got to go see it. <laughs> it was like romantic or whatever. And so then, I mean, it all comes back to Disney. I grew up in the 90s. And that was the Disney Renaissance with those amazing Alan Menken, Howard Ashman, Disney musicals, Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, uh, Aladdin. So the main media I was consuming was basically a book musical but animated so i think like my mom probably saw me running around singing beauty and the beast as well as like i remember i kept i would always call it mary martin peter pan where i'd watch the you know peter pan musical but i was like no 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 no, not like the animated peter pan i want mary martin peter pan and so you know i grew up watching all that stuff and then phantom tour came in town when i was four years old and my parents thought it was a good decision to take me and um, I've told this story a lot, and so I'll do the Reader's Digest. But went to see the show, didn't understand the concept that like you can't just go see the Phantom of the Opera every night of your life, but was like, can I go the next night? And my parents were like, oh, I guess we can try and figure out a way to take you two nights in a row. Like, I don't know how this works. <laughs> so they took me the next night, and I said, I was like, I really want to give the fan of this Beanie Baby. Because Beanie Babies, this is the most 90s story of anyone's life. And um, I had this like ghost Beanie Baby that I'm wearing your Jordache and your Beanie yeah, Baby. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I have yeah, right. like butterfly clips in my hair. Right. And, um, and I was like, can I give the fan of this Beanie Baby? My mom doesn't like know what a stage door is. Like, we're truly like asking her, like, how do we get something to the actor who's playing the Phantom? And then, um, and then at intermission, the like dresser or someone associated with the Phantom found the only four year old girl in the audience and was like, Mr. Little, the actor playing the fan at the time, Brad Little, he was like, Mr. Little would love to see you all after the show. And this man, he's played Phantom. He's one of the people who's played Phantom the most. He spent like an hour with me after the show and my wow. family. And he like showed me how the prosthetics work. He put like me in the boat, showed us how the mirror worked and everything. And that truly was, I think my mom clearly saw something happening in my eyes and was like, you know how you take like swim lessons? You can take this lessons. And so then she put me in at the time, like the theater class for kids was the Humphrey School of Musical Theater at Theater Under the Stars in Houston, Texas. So starting when I was four, I started taking classes at Tuts, and then I was in my first professional show when I was six, uh, which was Scrooge, which is a version of Christmas Carol starring Gary Beach's uh, Ebenezer Scrooge. And, um, um, oh my God, I think Rodney Hicks was playing all three ghosts. (laughs) It was some version where like, they're just like, you know what? And I remember there was like a Microsoft joke in it with like a computer booting up and it felt like very contemporary. Everyone was like, oh, this is very contemporary. There was like a golf cart in it, but it was great. It was in the round and I played one of the Cratchit children and that was my first show ever. And so I would say a combination of the fan of the opera and Disney is what took us here today. And Why? then, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to like, and then here we are promoting a phantom slash based on a children's book 
um, a studio recording. So it all makes sense. It all, it's all come for a full circle. And thank you, Phantom, for inspiring your parents to get down to business. Literally. Um, thank God. Literally. The, literally. <laughs> literally, they got down to business. The rest of this podcast is us just saying literally in voices. Get ready. Can literally. We? <laughs> Done. Incredible. <laughs> incredible content. Incredible. I, I've been watching uh, uh, Big Mouth again because oh, season, yes. season five just came out. And I, have you ever seen it? I am obsessed oh, I with have. Nick Kroll and all 27 voices he does on that show. It's, it's literally incredible. over 20 voices. I think it's, it's 20, incredible. It's it and Lola is totally my favorite. You and, need to be on Big Mouth. Well, Listen. I, I'll tell you what you gotta do. I mean, sometimes, oh sometimes you just gotta, you know, you just gotta, you know, just you know, get it on. Just found him in the opera. That's all you gotta do. My, How's that? How's this that? Is, this is audio only, so people cannot see that my mouth is a gate. I am just like, <laughs> I, I am wow mom over here. This is incredible. <laughs> amazing, amazing, amazing. Well, if any voiceover agents are out there, hook me up. because you know, can... It's also Meatwad. That's also the Meatwad voice from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. It's a Meatwad. Yes, it's, it's, and it's, it feels like a relative of uh, the Experiment 626 stitch as well. A little it's bit. Great. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And listen, for voiceover people out there, he also has an incredible setup. Like, I don't know if this is <laughs> it's, it's truly your quality. And that's like half the battle right now. Why, thank you. Oh, my God, um, Alan. Alan, who knew? Who knew this was just what this was going to be? <laughs> my God, I'm your publicist now. Alan's All great. right, let's do this. I want to. I also, also want to uh, get with with Catherine Gallagher and uh, start a podcast called um, uh, something with uh, horoscope readings. I just want like fans to call in with Catherine, oh, she, and she just and she just reads her horoscopes live on podcast. Well, she's she is a witch. Like I, <laughs> I, I forget. I'm like I'm so sure she's fine with me telling all these stories. One time, I like think around the holidays, and by holidays, I mean Halloween. I like FaceTimed her, and I was like, <laughs> and I was like, I was like, hey, what do you? Do? I was like, the lighting on your face is like so interesting. Like, what? Where are you? And then she turned her camera around. It's because she was like sitting crisscross applesauce in front of like a cauldron with candles and she's like oh i'm just like doing my spells and i was like cool 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 cool, cool, cool. anyway right. so it's on, it's on brand. Um, oh. yeah no she's amazing she's very she's both witchy but then she's also just like the most attuned listening thoughtful genius person so i feel like she's good at mm. helping giving advice and reading into people's stars yeah, so she's a great you... crystal company. She's a great crystal company called Really. Um, yeah, it's called Vibes, and I think their their uh, URL is like vibes.metaphysicalsupplystore.com, and that's my plug for Catherine Gallagher. Well, I'll so, look it up. We'll we'll figure it out. Put it in the show yeah, notes. Yeah. I just saw great. Catherine last night uh, uh, in oh. in Jagged. I went to saw, to see the show and <gasps> crushed it. Amazing. Crushed it. She's yeah, so. she's just one of the best. I watched her do the. She did like a concert with Seth Rudetsky the other night, and I'm just like. The fact, and she just sang Broadway. Like, she sang so, mm. like, very, very Broadway the whole time. Like, I'm talking, she did, like, all the shows she did when she was in high school. And it was, like, Gypsy and City of Angels. And to see her sing, because obviously, she, her majority of her musical theater career has been very contemporary. So, it's, like, to see her sing both back-to-back, I'm just, like, she's incredible. She's amazing. She's so good at what she does. And she's such a hard worker and such a great person. And so... I'm. I love being her best friend, but I also love being her number one fan. And I, I miss her so much. And I'm just so. I also can't wait to see her in Gossip Girl. I, I am now your and Catherine Gallagher's publicist. We're gonna take a short break. Stay tuned for more of the episode. What do you prefer singing? Because you've got, I mean, of course, on TV, very well known for Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. And, and so do you have a, a a preference on what you like to sing in terms of, you know, you've been, you've done the Von Trapp stuff and you've been the <laughs> Kate stuff and, you know, you've got contemporary stuff. Do you have a preference on, on where you like to go when you're singing in the shower? Oh my gosh. I think that I... I don't know. I mean, I've been really lucky in that I've been able to be very challenged by a lot of the material that I do. I remember when I did Newsies at the time, it was like the most challenging song that like Watch What Happens song was so challenging. And then the idea of like when I got Zoe's and 
was like aware that the two songs I'd be singing were Whitney Houston and Bon Jovi, just two people that I never thought my chords would be able to handle their songs. I was like, cool, 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 cool. So it's been wonderful in that I've been able to be challenged by material that like I eventually felt comfortable with. But at the same time, like, for example, I guess Always True to You was something that I sang for sophomore evaluations while I was in college because I was like, oh, this is a song I feel very comfortable singing and it's fun and I'll just do this. And there's a cute 16 bar in it. And then it turned like, even when I was auditioning for Kiss Me Kate, I remember being like, oh, this is going to be relatively simple for me vocally. And so that, I mean, that was just so fun. And I mean, the, I still like, the end of the end, the they did such a beautiful job with those orchestrations for that revival as well. And like the end, oh my god, I was like being wheeled off on stage, and truly, I felt like these the horn section just was like allowed to live their best lives. And sometimes, <laughs> like someone sampled, there's this amazing um, artist who's also in Hamilton named Trey Curtis, and he sampled um, my recording of Always True to You, which is also on Ghostlight Records, which is also a Goosebumps is on. And he sampled it and like, it was, I really just got to hear the horn section in a way I'd never been able to hear it before. And it just was like basically getting to belt like a Broadway person and just like have horns go crazy. Like it's some type of like, got to get a gimmick moment was unbelievable. But at the same time, it's like, I, you know, doing like shows like Roman Holiday and I did an opera in New York City Opera when I was 14. And so there is like secretly, I feel like under all the like, bits and hitch kicks there is like a soprano somewhere deep inside that gets to like play every once in a while which is fun and really great too so yeah this is an extended version of being like i like you know i like contrasting cuts that are basically musical theater so give me like a soprano moment and then a belty moment but i love it all and i loved understudy buddy because that was something where i got to be like really belty at the end and then just got to have a lot of fun And I do find myself with like, watch what happens and always true to you. I find myself in very lyric heavy songs often, which I very much enjoy and are fun. So that didn't answer my question at all. It in, regard, it, it, in regards to the shower, but it did. Expo- oh, the shower! It, oh, it, oh, it, it opened up. It opened up a lot more. No, it's everything. In the, I sho- totally, in the shower, I totally I'm doing it. Disney impressions. In the shower, I'm doing. I'm doing like <laughs> trying to trying to be a face character at Disney parks. That was Disney. one of my goals when I first started out performing. I wanted to be. I was like a face character. What? Ooh, they get they get paid like two dollars an hour more. Ooh, yeah, because. It just was it would be my dream to like pretend to be one of these icons and then get to inter- make like kids' dreams come true all day. And adults who want to meet. Because I've I've freaked out over Disney characters before. My why goodness. Do you, why do you think okay, we're gonna get into into some some deep stuff here. Why do you think I know like children, magic, make believe, what et cetera, et cetera, but why do you think adults are so, so drawn to and and just dig into this Disney culture. You have people propose there. They get they get married there. They bring their kids there. Their kids bring their kids there. And I, I want to sort of, I guess, lead with a little bit of my thought in that I think that we all are going through life um, always thinking about needing our parents' approvals and oh, therefore want to go back to being kids and that simpler time. And I'm, I'm, I'm pulling out random thoughts here, but I feel like Disney allows you to feel and ex- I guess get away with kind of not caring about adulting for a hot minute and being that kid. And then, so being that kid again, why is that important? I mean, I think it, you hit the nail on the head in that I will say, I think it is, different for everyone. There's a lot of different types of Disney adults. And I think that whether it's someone who, you know, isn't as obsessed with necessarily like the company or the franchises or IP, but someone who just has the tradition of going there with their parents and wants to take their kids. I know that's how it was for my, my mother. It was more of a, like, she did it as a kid and was like, uh, I can't wait to take my kids here someday. For me, I'm so obsessed with their storytelling and their theming. And I think it's something like, 
I mean, you talk about like going back and like reconnecting. What's so interesting is I think so many of us went through a lot during these past like two years. And I think that, you know, I definitely grew in a lot of ways and I, some things about me are different, but at the same time, it's like, I was so interested to see how it would feel to go back for the first time after such a long time away. And I was so happy that I felt very similarly. It's one of the things that I feel like very similar towards, but at at the same time, my point of view is shifted in that I think that I, I said this often on the press tour for Newsies that I think one reason these Disney characters resonate so much with people, whether we're talking like Snow White singing into a wishing well to Winnie the Pooh to, you know, these Newsies fighting for, you know, their lives. For their pigs. That, yep, for the pigs is that I think that Disney characters, you know, the heroes, they have this sense of hope and this like sense of like, you know, this thing that they're fighting for, this thing that they want, that they will get it or they will try, or maybe even on their journey, the thing that they want might shift and that they'll ultimately end up where they need to be. And I think that's something we all feel. I think when you go to the park, not only is it something truly to look forward to, and I think, you know, Taylor Swift was like, I think on her, she was like 30 things I learned. Like by the time I was 30, she like did an article about it. It was so important. She was like, I think it's really important to have something to look forward to. And she was like, and I think Disney for a lot of people, it's that thing to look forward to. And Mm. it is also when you're there, it's just so positive and it's so happy. And it's just, it's just, that represents so much to so many people. So I think that's like something that I love about it. I just love the hope and that it's like so many people involved with the stories in the park. It's like their dream to work there and now they're working there or their dream to go there and now they're there. And so everyone who's there, except for like the dads that are pulled along or the spouses that are pulled along by people who don't necessarily want to be there. Like everyone there wants to be there. And then most people who don't want to be there are like kind of turned around by the end of the day for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's a, an amalgamation of a lot of different things. But I think that there is a sense of imagination, innovation, hope, and, you know, that inner child. And I think the whole point is like when we're children, we're so simple and it's so simple, but it's so clear what we all want. And it's not muddied by experience or all these anxiety and all these other things that we go through. So it's almost like you can go back to your base when you're there. But also I'm there because I want to see the recent innovation with like the web slingers attraction and see how they're doing this audio <laughs> and spidey. And I like the snacks. And so it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of things and it's not often you get to see a big marching band. Sometimes you just like want to go see a marching band do some tunes. That I love that answer. There's so much, and I expected something more standard, but it was it was so tailored to you. And while you were talking about it, I, I realized that yeah, it's it's going to be different. It's got to be different for everybody. Part of it, part of it for me is is remembering my grandparents going with my grandparents uh-huh. and and you know explaining or, you know, what what my grandfather would tell me about the secrets. I'd love to like feel feel like I was part of the club to know some of the things that other people didn't, and and just to feel like I had that bond with him. And there's, you know, pictures of me and my brother around the fountains with the flower arrangements that yeah. still exist in their exact mm-hmm. way now. And I, I noticed a picture the other day that I took of my first son when he was one, the first time we brought him there, doing the exact same thing that there is a picture of me doing at that age and then in that exact place. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm a wreck. This is, I don't know what it was about it. That, exactly. That all of a sudden just like feels like it belongs. Yeah. And I just think that it's, it's Disney is just able to, I don't know. It's like simultaneously timeless yet. Like Disney is, himself was very famous for saying like Disneyland will never be complete. It mm-hmm. will like always be growing and evolving. And I know like for, for the diehard fans, 
that's something we always like repeat to ourselves and like something we love is being taken away or something we love is being changed. We're just like, no, well said, Disney will always be evolving. Like it will always be evolving. It'll always be evolving. But like at the same point, there are things that the flower arrangements, yeah, there may be a petunia here and there that's like a slightly different color, but it's the same construct at the end of the day. And I think it's that thing that it's like, it's dependable, but like there's new ways of discovering it. My favorite way to go to Disneyland is like, with new people. Like I love going with new people and seeing their reactions for the first time or people who are like, I don't know about this. And I'm like, well, let's go. Like, let's go. We'll be very chill. Like I won't make us run around to places. Like we'll just do whatever we want. And then like slowly, but surely they're like, like they're inhaling the pixie dust and they're like, yes, <laughs> I get it. Get me a Mickey hat and a churro. Let's go. So yeah, I love, but then I also love, again, like I love bringing new people, but then I also just like, truly could sit there and watch like like the last time I went I watched I, I was on Main Street and I just sat on Main Street and watched someone had accidentally let a balloon go and I just watched the balloon go until I couldn't see it anymore in the sky and I just like was listening to the Main Street music play and I'm like this is weird but like we're doing no, it you can, you can if you have a smart speaker you can ask it to play theme park the theme music Incredible. Yeah. So you can you can ask your your Alexa or Google device or whatever you've got. It's like to play the magic the uh Magic Kingdom theme or the Epcot theme theme. So glad you're in my you're in my air my AirPods right now, or else she'd be going off in the other room. She's very sensitive. You you whisper her name and she's like, Yes, I am here. I'm here to Um, bring you the Disney music. I love mm -hmm. it. Um I I absolutely just, I cannot wait to go back. We've been obviously COVID scared to mm-hmm. to do much of anything. And like theater is where I feel the safest at this point because of all of the the vaccine yeah. stuff and everything going on. And you said you're in LA now mm-hmm. um, and obviously have a big, a big theater person. Oh, you said earlier that you felt like a Broadway, a big Broadway person alongside everybody else, but you are a Broadway person. You, like you've, you've earned, you've earned that. You were there. So let that <laughs> let that imposter syndrome go because you 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 belong to call you you definitely belong to be a part of that club too, um, but you always done TV you've done movies you've done the Broadway and, and do you have I guess you're in LA focusing on TV film but is there like do you have plans to come back do you still send in self tapes for theaters like or for for a theater out here like would you come back for Broadway right now? Oh yeah, like I. I just kind of go where the work is, but also at the same time was kind of just like, I was here working the last week before everything shut down and then was like, okay, I guess like this is where we're going to be for a while because this is where I have a place. And then it just so happened that I mean, and I was able to work like a day here and there over the past two years, but not until a few months ago did I get like probably my most consistent job since like before the pandemic. And so that obviously has me here very consistently and for a while, but um, no, I like love Broadway. I miss it all the time. I'm doing a job. I can't really like talk too much about, which is like the most actor thing that's ever been said in the actor land of actors. But (laughs) there are a lot, there are Broadway people in it and like adjacent Broadway people and we truly just talk about Broadway all the time and sing Broadway all the time. And I'm just like, I miss Broadway. And so I, I love musical theater. I miss musical theater. I like, I, I just truly, I love it so much. I would, I would love, I just like want to see shows again, let alone be in them again. And yeah, so I love it all. And I just kind of go where the wind blows a la Bohemian Rhapsody. And this is where I am currently. No, but I love, I love Broadway and I, um, I, I mean, I'm like what the, no, the, the other things I can plug right now is that I'm like loving listening to the symphonic suites by Angela Weber. Like mm. that's me, like with my AirPods on, I'm not like, I, I'm either listening to Red Taylor's version or like this orchestral 60 piece version of like the Sunset Boulevard soundtrack. So I love Broadway. I miss Broadway. I, um, I need to like start seeing shows here but I, again, have just been like, my main thing has been like 
this job and like obviously like j- just kind of focusing that on that and I still have it like I'm still very much less social than I was before so but I think I, I am planning on seeing a show before the end of the year here so I'm very excited about that and that'll be beautiful and I'm sure I will cry and like cry through five billion masks and I can't wait I was at I was at the the reopening night of Moulin Rouge. Oh my gosh, I can't imagine. I can't it, imagine. It, the the energy and every other line was a standing ovation. It was just <gasps> everyone was so happy to be back in a way that they had never appreciated theater before. And and I, I love that it's I love that it's coming uh, coming back globally. I mean, we still, of course, need to do our part and stay safe and get yeah, vaccinated yeah. and all but of I, that. I love theater for doing everything that they're doing to keep people safe. I love that. And I'm obsessed with it. And I love Broadway. And I love them for doing that. And I love all my friends that are in musicals right now. And I want to go see them. I'll have to start with my LA shows. But I will eventually make it back. I think, I think when I'm wrapped which should be like spring of next year like i will 100 percent. i mean i gotta see six i gotta see diana i gotta see what else do i need to see um, Is on? gotta see jagged again yeah yes of course of course of course i did get to see both but i will need to see them again there's just so many things i need company. to see company oh my god mm-hmm. i need to see company oh my god, my god. that was something my like the thought of seeing Patty Lapone reaction and Katrina Link. Oh my gosh. Everyone in that <laughs> cast is so good. Um, and Terrence Archie, shout out to Sneak Kate. Um, but I can't, uh, yeah, no, I can't wait to see all of it. And I, I will be there at some point. I'm so excited. But in the meantime, getting to sing on Goosebumps was incredible. And truly, like just like listening to everyone's voices on that, Christina, Will, mm-hmm. oh my God, Noah. Mm-hmm. Alex Brightman in his natural habitat of spookiness and singing spooky songs. Right? It's so good. It's so good. And I want a song with Shirley Ralph. What? Yeah. It's truly, it's truly amazing. It's truly amazing. It's so, truly, yes. truly amazing. Like Gem and the Holograms. So yes. Goosebumps the Musical, Phantom of the Auditorium, original studio cast recording on Ghostlight Records, everywhere you stream your music. Listen to it. Now it it is it really is phenomenal. I, I've been listening to it and cannot say enough nice things about it. And so with that, let's wrap up with the three standard closing questions. I ask everybody. Oh the first boy. one, very simply, is just what motivates you. What motivates me? Um gosh. I truly listened to Allison Love say these and I was like, oh, look, he says the same questions at the end. You need to remember this. And this is why I, I was, always I was wondering if you had prepared. No, I didn't. And I truly am so mad that I didn't. What motivates me? I would say uh, the happiness of others. Is that weird? Like, I just think like, I love like bringing joy to other people and making other people laugh. And if there's an opportunity to make someone's day that I find that very motivating. That's a, that's a very uh, uh, Disney-esque answer. Not in a yeah, bad like, way. I just, I just mean like you get joy out of other people's joy. I uh, so much so, so much so. It's I very love that. true. So then, what advice would you give to your younger self and younger people listening now, starting out down a similar path? I think I'd say, you know, you, I think Allison said something about being like authentic to yourself, and I just think that's such a good answer, like uh, authenticity, but also just like checking just making sure that you are checking in with yourself every step of the way and being like how does this make me feel does this make me feel great let's keep on doing that how does this make me feel i know this is like what i used to want but like do i still want this i think just always taking time for yourself and self reflection and making sure that like what you you are pursuing what you want specifically mm-hmm. i think that'd be great and then i would just say like you know take take notes oh my gosh what i would probably say is like you can, there is something to learn from every person you meet and interact with. And there's always something to learn. You will never know everything and learn about the stuff that, well, this is like an oxymoron. It's like, learn about the stuff you don't know. Like go, if you don't know it, learn about it. But the stuff you know a lot about, there's even more to learn. And that's where you should also really apply yourself. That's something they said in college. They were like, listen, you may come in here and you're not, you're not a dancer or you're not a 
pianist, but like learn about those things because you need to learn about those things to like really be well-rounded. But at the same time, if you come in and you're really funny, really delve into comedy, really find out about what is, uh, what makes a comedian a comedian. And I think that that was really important. So learn about everything. Oh my God. Um, Oh my God. Big mouth. (laughs) Big mouth is hot. Wes Taylor told me um, he's got a he's got a big he went to NC uh, North Carolina School of the Arts and and studied like Shakespeare and like real serious drama kind of stuff and he says that it was the Shakespeare that helped him get that much better at comedy. Mm, that makes because, total sense because it was it was the rhythm it was the the literal pattern of the speech it recipe was, it, it reci- yeah it was, it was learning the recipe so you know again when you look into something that you think is. Uh, uh, outside of your scope, it's you can find something to apply it back to you. So that's a wonderful answer. And then, so now you know the last question coming. If you could only see one show for the rest of your life, but you can see it as many times as you want, what would you see? What's so funny is this is what I remember Alison Love said, because we were in parade together. <laughs> Alison Love and I were in parade together. She said parade. Um, she was, I think she was, no, she wasn't Isla Stover. She was one of the other ones though. She sang the she was one of those people um Mm -hmm. but i was lizzie fagan mary fagan's sister um back in the day um if i could only see one show for the rest of my life and this is a question i thought about this was a question i thought about because obviously um the, the the chords of the music of the night run through my veins and so part of me would be like, well, yeah, the fan of the opera is probably the show that I've seen the most. But then I thought, because what's your answer? Rent. Rent. That's a great one. I think I remember this. Rent is a great one because you have a little bit of everything. And so the thing about Phantom is you don't get a little bit of everything. It's very much kind of the, we're living in the same uh, vocabulary. And um, so I would love to see Phantom of the Opera over and over again. But then like, truly, I don't know why it truly just like came to me when I was listening to Alice in Love. I was like, and I'm scared to even say this, but part of me was like, Susical? <laughs> <laughs> just because I feel like if you see Susical, I feel like so many people could go so many different ways with Susical. I, there's so many different stylings in Susical, and there's so many like random performances in Susical. Like, I could see a show where there's just like the Sour King Guru has never been better. Like, and they make it all about the Sour King Guru or the Wicked Sham Brothers. Like, it is, they are on another level. So I will probably still stick with the Phantom of the Opera, but I'm going to say like, cause my other shows that I love are Cabaret, Batboy and like, Oh, there's some other ones. I'm really into something Boulevard right now, but, um, but I think I'm going to go with Phantom of the Opera, but then I'm also going to get like, kind of su- like, I don't know why I just think Susical is such a bop. Like it's so good. Those songs. Oh, the things you can think. Think it's more to <laughs> Can you imagine? Like, can you imagine seeing like the most like random people in Susical? Like seeing a cast of four year olds in Susical, but then going and seeing like the broad like can you imagine like what if Kelly O'Hara was in Susical? Like I just there's like all these different Susical can go so many ways. Kelly O'Hara, Ramin Karamlu. Oh wait, uh, but like but like I'm just like I just I'm like has Leslie Margarita ever been in Susical? Like, that needs to, like, she, like... Oh, my I mean, God. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that... But I'm like, who would she be? She could be everyone. She, the one-man show of Susical, starring Leslie Margarita as everyone. <laughs> I'm crying. I'm, I'm, my eyes are watering. <laughs> my eyes are watering. Let's, let's put it out in the universe, and then TikTok's gonna go make it. Done. Amazing. Can't wait. TikTok's, TikTok's going to get Leslie Margarita to do this because I feel like TikTok has that power now. Mm-hmm. So where can we find you on on the in, on the on the Instagrams on the social media? That's medias? where you can find me. That's well, where just, you can find me on Instagram at by styles b y s t y l e s. You can find me there, and then you can find me on Ghostlight Records, Goosebumps the Musical, wherever you get your music unless the one place you get your music is like an old timey record store then i don't think we have a, like a 45 yet or anything <laughs> well the the new trend is releasing everything on vinyl so it's probably only a matter of time 
I can't wait. I can't wait to have that scratchy, prickly, staticky intro before you he- hear the Do you seek out the spark, a stranger in the dark? Of Christina with her crystal clear waterfall of a voice. Unbelievable. She is, she is re- she, rather great. It's so good. It's it, so good. And she's, and like, she's, I'm sorry. I know we need to wrap this up. I got to go too. But it's like, <laughs> she truly is so good. But then she has these like dialogue bits where I'm like, girl, I know you're in a booth with no one else there. We have an exchange where I'm like, we weren't there. We weren't there together. And yet like, I feel you playing with me. Like I feel, I feel you feeding off my energy and neither of us are there and neither of us are talking to anyone. And I was like, and that's a professional. She's amazing. Sign she off. Was, she was Christina. just, she had you in her head. Yeah, Christina. Christina is, is, is phenomenal. I love, did they have you do like lots of different takes and stuff and put it all together? Or was it just like a couple reads and that was it? Yes and no. I mean, Understudy Buddy was something where they literally would be like, and go. Because it's so fast that I really had to do like, I could, it would have to be large sections of it. But um, there definitely were, I, I have a few like lines in it. And those I would just say 5 billion times, 5 billion different ways. And like, I think we got it. And then it's just like, I truly sing so... And they were like, could you sing these notes in the Span of the Opera song? And I was like, I was like, let's go. And I'm going to plie and we'll see what happens. And like, they're on there. They're like, have so much sin because they're a fan of the opera and I wouldn't have it any other way. So if you want to hear me sing the highest I've ever sang, Story of the Phantom, you want to hear me sing the lowest I've ever sung. I think it's called The Legend. I take a low harmony at one point with Charlie Ralph, which is a sentence I never thought I'd say. That should be my new Instagram bio. Takes the low <laughs> note at one point. I never <laughs> thought I'd say that. And that was something I definitely think I, I don't know if I could do that every day of my life. But you can hear it on the studio cast recording. I saw uh, Megan Hilty's 54 Below show uh, a couple weeks ago. And, and she, <gasps> does, she did this whole medley of, um, of alto lines from shows. But it was, it, was the funniest, it was the funniest thing. She's like, those are actually legit alto lines. And it was just some of the lowest repetitive, not exciting lines. Uh, but of course, being oh, Megan Hilty, incredible. she made it incredibly funny. She's a legend. For, till this day, I, I'm like the two... She like cemented two Glinda... I'm sorry, we're going to talk forever, but still be the last thing I say. She did two things as Glinda that I'm like... They are... They forever changed Glinda for me, too. One, number one, I think she's the first person to go, ooh, pink looks good with green. Because she used to do the bit. She would go, I'm going to transform your frock into a beautiful ball gown. Ooh. And she did this like, ooh. And then she added it everywhere. And now a lot of Glinda's go, ooh, pink looks good with green. But she did the ooh first. Number two, she's the first person, I, as at least I'm aware, to ever do the, um, on like the third verse of Popular, um, when she, they go, uh did they have brains or knowledge? And she goes, don't make me laugh. Don't. They were popular, please. She was the first person to ever get mad. A lot of people would just be like, they were popular, please. But she went, uh, she was like, they were popular, please. And she got so mad. I'm sure you can find it on bootleg somewhere. But it's so funny. And she's just so smart. Like to do that, like to do those two bits, like those are both very smart bits that also aren't taking away from anything. They are in the text. And she's just interpreting them because she's a genius. And now I'm done plugging everyone ever. Done. You would I'm, be the I'm, best I'm publicist. The best publicist ever. Oh my God. Never met Megan Hilty in my life, but <laughs> she's incredible. Well, if she's you incredible. need Stephanie to be your publicist, hit her up on Instagram at bystyle. Wonderful. Uh, wonderful. You can get more of me at thetheaterpodcast.com. I'm on Instagram myself, the theater underscore podcast. I'll be your publicist. Why not? I'm on Twitter at the same thing. I don't barely, I barely use it, but I should. I actually need to start tweeting. Um, listen, <laughs> wherever you're listening, leave a rating and a review. This has been edited by well-rounded hoodlum productions and thank you to jukebox the ghost for the intro and the outro music and stephanie styles thank you this has been so much fun i just want to keep talking to you forever same same hopefully we can talk again some other time maybe at a broadway con in the future the broadway con and we'll go sit in the audience and go see stephanie styles (gasps) oh my god i mean uh catherine gallagher that's you are stephanie Styles. we'll go see catherine gallagher yes oh can't wait can't wait oh Make the world a little colorful